I think it's time for me to start. Is that okay? You guys ready? Okay. So today we finally uh, will be able to talk about Drinfeld modules. And I want to stress that the Carlitz module that I've been talking about is a Drinfeld module. It's just a, like a special one. So we gave it a special name. It's historically the first one um, that people talked about. It was first studied, like I said last time, um, by Carlitz himself. Although he did not know what he was doing, he was only studying this exponential function that I gave you and noticing that it had some properties like the classical exponential function and wrote several papers about this, maybe like three or four. Um, and it's only late, and that was in the 20s or the 30s, and it's only in the 70s um, that Drinfeld came along and kind of unified the theory, Drinfeld modules of any rank, um, and then that Hayes wrote this very nice, extremely readable paper about the class field theory that goes with the Carlitz module. Um, so we have already started Drinfeld modules. I just have been calling it the Carlitz module because it's a special rank one. one. So why would you care about Drinfeld modules apart from that'll make the next hour of your life better and you're mathematicians and they're awesome? Say your friends and family are asking you, you can always show them this video. We just need a minute. It's from 24. Hopefully that doesn't date me too much. Oh, is that, that's not loud enough. <laughs> don, don, don. That's the only thing they say about it. So hopefully you could hear it. Wow. Um, it's not true. <laughs> So anyway, if you want to show this to people, it's, it's on my husband math vlog. We actually had to get released from Fox to post this because it <laughs> infringed on their copyright, but they let us. <laughs> okay, so you can use Drinfeld modules to disable centrifuge if people are about to explode them to bring about a nuclear holocaust on American soil. <laughs> Tell that to your parents. <laughs> okay. So we're going to continue um, today with the Carlitz module. There's a few more things that I want to tell you. So here's my plan. Um, is, is to go kind of medium fast through the Carlitz module to keep as many of you here with me. And then go kind of fast through Drinfeld modules of higher rank. And then talk about uh, Drinfeld modules of rank 2, which are near and dear to my heart. And at that point, if you don't know about elliptic curves, maybe a lot of it will be uh, very confusing. But hopefully it will give you stuff to Google and think about afterwards. And you'll be like um, stimulated to further study rather than hopelessly confused. And if you're hopelessly confused, let me know. Okay, so Carlos module, um, again, just to um, reiterate, it is the Drinfeld module of rank one. Why do I say that? Um, over an algebraically closed field up to isomorphism, there's only uh, one isomorphism class uh, of Drinfeld modules of rank one. So you can, you know, call it the Drinfeld module of rank one. And um, I'm going to present this in the shape of my analogy, where on this side I'll have the number field stuff, and on this side I'll have the function field stuff um, to try to keep your mind thinking about both sides and give you something to think about. So, uh, like I said, on the number field side we have the exponential function, which is given by Arguably the simplest Taylor series. And on um, the function field side, we have the Carlitz exponential function, which is given, um, again, by maybe the simplest Taylor series. 
And I've talked yesterday about the analogy between, like, this is the size of an integer of size n, and that's the size of a polynomial of degree n. And this is the product of all the numbers less than or equal to n. This is the product of all the polynomials. Okay, so I, I, should, I should have stressed that. In my mind, like, whenever I write a, I mean a polynomial. Um, so a monic, the degree of a is n. Okay, so, so this is arguably an analog of the exponential. Of course, I'm not taking the things of lower degree, but that's something that's um, done a lot in function field to focus on one degree because there's already many polynomials of one degree. And the monic is the same, the analog of thinking of positive because you just want to not multiply by units. Then you have more stuff than you need. Okay, so we both start um, with this like exponential functions on both sides. And then um, what, is, what is true, right? Well, uh, this one usually in uh, over the complex numbers, we say like it's holomorphic, right? It doesn't have any poles or anything. Um, on this side, the word that I've seen used is entire, but you could say holomorphic, you could say regular, you could, I mean, there's many ways to talk about functions that um, don't have poles. So they're both, um, you know, well-behaved. And um, for, for this one, uh, that was an exercise after lecture two. Once we knew about convergence of Taylor series, we could prove that actually pretty easily. Um, if I think of the exponential function as going from C to C cross, so if I avoid zero, it's surjective. Um, this function is also surjective, this time um, on all of C, all of C infinity. Um, that's not something that I'm going to prove, but it follows from general non-Archimedean um, analysis principles. So a non-constant entire function on a, with, with respect to a non-Archimedean valuation is always surjective. So it's, it's, it's just kind of like analytical stuff. Um, and then on this side, I can ask about the kernel of the exponential function, okay, by which I mean, um, you know, just z such that the exponential of z is 1, right? I don't want 0 because I'm mapping to c cross, also I would get nothing, okay? And uh, hopefully you know that this is all the integer multiples of 2 pi i, and uh, what's more, uh, 2, pi, 2 pi is a transcendental number. Well, on this side, I could do the same thing. I could ask for the kernel of the Carlitz function, which here is going to be z such that ECZ is 0, because here I'm, I'm still um, thinking of all of C infinity, and EC is an additive function. And uh, it turns out, okay, that this is some number which we call pi tilde, perhaps, I mean, not perhaps, because of the analogy, times um, fq brackets t, which are my integers. And um, this is a, a specific transcendental number. Uh, I mean, I have formulas for it, which would not, like, pe people come up with formulas for it. It's like a thing, right? Um, just like people like to try to write, you know, expansions for pi and, and formulas for pi. It's the same kind of thing, but, they, you know, it's a transcendental number. I mean, it is what it is. But what I want to bring up, right, is that um, this is a rank one lattice in, two, in C, and this is a rank one fq brackets t lattice in C infinity, right? It's all multiples. Like this is all polynomial multiples of one number. Um, so that's, you know, another um, 
analogy between these two, that their kernel as rank one as a module over what we consider to be the integers. And then uh, we're, oh, and how do you prove this? Sorry, I just want to, I'm not going to prove it, but I want to say a little something. Um, the way you can prove this, the way that's not too difficult to prove this, is to actually write um, this exponential function as a product um, over the elements of this lattice, 1 minus z over that. And it's many tedious steps of algebra to do this, but it's not super difficult. Um, you first do sort of, a, you do like a finite product over the elements of this, just the polynomial ring, and then you compute at each step what that final finite polynomial is as a sum, and then you, you let the degree go to infinity, and you get a product where here you're taking the product over the polynomials, but then you got like some ugly factors in here. And so you're like, well, if I wasn't, you know, like wanting my product to be over the polynomials, but like over like some pro some fact, some multiple of the product, the polynomials, then I would get this lattice. So anyway, I'll, I don't know if that helped any. It's not super complicated, mostly tedious, and I want to move on. Um, but we'll have these expressions come up later. So um, in a while, when I introduce more general exponential functions, I'll do them in terms of these products because then it's really easy to see their kernel, right? If you're, if lambda is in the last, sorry, and I should say here, I don't want lambda to be zero, okay? Zero is definitely in that lattice because uh, it's zero times pi tilde but I don't want to divide by zero. So that's why there's a little Z in front and then all the other non-zero um, elements of the lattice. Okay, so if I plug in lambda to be in the lattice and I get one minus one, so that's a simple zero of this function. And that's how you get the kernel from it. Okay, so you, you have that. And then uh, the last part, which I kind of talked about, um, on this side, we have that the exponential of n times z is the exponential of z to the n for um, any integer. And what we'll see on this side, which we have kind of started working out, and if you did the exercises from yesterday, you've started working out, we'll see that for all a in fq brackets t, uh, there exists a polynomial CA, which is which is actually um, in the twisted polynomial ring in tau with coefficient. Sorry. Oh. So I always call this ring A, and I've been trying to avoid introducing this notation to not overload things, but then I used it. So um, that's all I mean. Okay. There's a polynomial in tau with polynomial coefficients such that um, if I take EC of AZ, right, which is the analog of doing this, then uh, what happens is this polynomial to ECZ. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this polynomial a lot more. I'm just continuing the analogy for a little longer um, before I say more about this. Okay, and, and this assigns on this side, right, to each n some polynomial z to the n. And here I'll think that this assigns to each A this polynomial CA. And that's the crucial, like, bones of a Drenfeld module. It's an assignment 
of a polynomial to an integer. For each integer, you get some polynomial. Where here I'm using integer loosely, right? For me, integers are polynomials because they're integers in the function field, right? Here, integers are integers, like one, two, three, right? And you get a polynomial out of it. So here for each integer, I get a polynomial over my integers. And that, when I define Drinfeld modules, that's what I will say. A Drinfeld module is an assignment to each polynomial, like to each integer of some other polynomial, some further polynomial. Um, and then uh, we, look, we look at the torsion points. Right, like you fix n, you look at z to the n is equal to 1. These generate abelian extensions of q. It's actually much stronger than that. It generates all the abelian extensions of q, the, the, the roots of these polynomials. The roots of unity generate every single abelian extension of q. <coughs> Right, right, right. Sorry. I mean, like, every abelian extension is contained in one of these, not like literally there are no other abelian extensions than cyclotomic polynomials. Sorry. Yes. There are two quadratics you can get like this, but not the other ones. Um, and so here on this side, we'll do the same thing. We'll consider these torsion points. Right, so now there'll be CA of Z is equal to zero, and this will generate most abelian extensions of um, FQ round brackets T. And I'll, I'll be a lot more precise about like what I mean by most. Okay, so that's the analogy, right? That's like like what's happening. This is the way in which the Carlitz module is an analog of exponentials and this, you know, this whole story. Okay, so let me dig in the side of the paper a little bit more, right? So last time we had um, as a proposition... that um, EC of TZ was TECZ plus ECZ raised to the Q, okay? And, and I just want to remind you, right, I'm working over FQ brackets T, so this T is that T and this Q is that Q, right? Like I'm, I'm fixing this polynomial ring, so Q and T have a meaning here, okay? And the proof is... Um, Extremely pleasing and not at all scary, so I will do it. So you just plug in like a hopeful person like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute EC of TZ minus T, EC of Z, and hope that I get EC to the Q. So that's... The sum n is equal to zero to infinity of um, t to the q to the n, z to the q to the n, minus t, z to the q to the n, all over the n. Okay, because here I'm multiplying t outside, so I only get um, this much. And I actually notice that if n is equal to zero, q to the zero is one, so I get t, z minus t, z, so I get zero. So I'm going to just start my sum at n is equal to 1 now. And I get t to the q to the n minus t z q to the n over dn. And here, okay, I'll have like a little aside that dn is equal to t to the q to the n minus t times dn minus 1 to the q. 
So that was in the lecture two exercises. If you got like bogged down in the weeds of like the DN and the LN and the square brackets and thing, you played with this a bunch. And if not, just believe me that this is true. Um, but in, in either case, uh, if I move this stuff around, I'll get, I'm just such a good taper and I tape it very well. Okay. I'll get that EC of TZ minus T of ECZ is the sum now starting at one of um, Z to the Q to the N divided by D sub N minus one to the Q. And now I use that I'm in characteristic P and P is a power of Q. Did I say it the wrong way? Yeah, you know what I mean. Then <laughs> Q is the power of P to get um, this expression, right? I, I can just extract a power of Q through a sum, um, as in the dreams of your calculus students. And now re-indexing my sum, right? I very cleverly am now starting at one. This is easy, EC of Z to the Q and I'm done. Okay, so it's like not a big deal at all to say this. But from this, as a corollary, we get the everything. We get the action of every other polynomial, okay, by recursion and um, F Q linearity of ECZ. So the corollary is uh, for all A and F Q T, there exists C A, um, and it will have integer coefficients, and it will have only um, x to the q and x to the q squared and x in it, um, such that uh, ec of az is equal to ca of ec, see? And, and you get like extra properties um, even out of this. Like it's not just any random polynomial. I mean, it's not, it's a specific one. There's a unique one, but um, it ha it, it's, it's very nice. And how would you do that? I'll just do like a quick, you know, how would you compute one of them, right? So if A were, for example, like T squared plus two, okay? If I wanted to know what EC of T squared plus two Z is, right? Like I wanna know what polynomial I get on the other side, well, first I use um, FQ linearity to say that this is EC T squared Z plus two ECZ. Okay, and why is this FQ linear? Is because um, my power series is in Z to the Q. And so every finite sum in this power series is FQ linear and so as I let and go to infinity in the sum, uh, it's also FQ linear. So that's why we spent all this time talking about FQ linear things so that I could have this. And then, okay, so here, you know, that's it. But on this side, I can use like a little trick, right? This is T, E, C, T, Z plus um, E, C, T, Z to the Q, so I'm, I'm thinking of T squared Z as T times TZ and applying what T does, right? I, I said that um, EC of T times something was T times EC of that thing plus EC of that thing to the Q. So I'm, I'm just like pulling one T out at a time plus two ECZ. And then now I'm gonna pull out the other T. So this is T squared ECZ plus T E C Z to the Q. And then I do the same thing here. This is T to the Q, E C Z to the Q, plus E C Z to the Q squared, right? Because I already had a Q and then I get another Q and I have plus two E C Z. 
And now I'm just going to collect all my terms. So I have t squared plus 2 ECZ plus um, t to the q plus t ECZ to the q plus ECZ to the q squared. So um, this is c sub t squared plus 2 of ECZ, where c sub t squared plus 2 is t squared plus 2 tau to the 0 plus t to the q plus t tau plus tau squared, right? Like when I plug in ECZ, I get just ECZ, ECZ to the Q, and ECZ to the Q squared. So this is the polynomial that I'm associating with T squared plus 2. The polynomial that tells me what happens to ECZ when I plug in T squared plus 2 inside of it. So what I want you to notice is first, this um, linear term is T squared plus 2, and I started with T squared plus 2. It is not a coincidence that will always happen, which you can trace out, right? Like one, a T came out and then the other T came out and the two came out and that would always happen. And then another thing um, that will always happen is that this is degree two and that is degree two in tau. That will also always happen because, right, no matter what the degree is here, I'll have to kind of apply this trick, like, you know, if it's degree N, like N times. So I'll end up with like a tau to the N at the end. And another thing that's like not so apparent from here, but actually whatever coefficient isn't from the highest power of tau is always going to be the leading coefficient of this polynomial. So this has leading coefficient one, so there's a one here. And if I had been thinking a little better, I would have picked something with not leading coefficient one so you could see it come out, but you would see the leading coefficient of the polynomial come out the other side. And then there's formulas even for the coefficients in the middle. I mean, like people have studied this a lot and gotten like all kinds of like pleasant things. So if you want to relax one evening, you can just compute a bunch of these. It's like very soothing, <laughs> I think. Okay, but that's what I mean, right? When, when I was saying, oh, way back here, right, that to every polynomial, I would associate a further polynomial. This is this assignment that I have, like the polynomial t squared plus two, and I assign to it this polynomial here. And it'll always have um, integer coefficients. There's no, right, there's no way I'm going to divide. Like, you've seen what I was doing. That would never happen. Okay, so I did that. I did that. Awesome. Okay, and so the last thing uh, that I want to say Oh, I forgot to say something. Okay, so let's go back to our analogy for a second. All right? The torsion points z such that z to the n is equal to 1, right? These are isomorphic to z mod n as a z module. Um, and here, uh, the torsion points of the Carlitz module they'll be isomorphic to FQ brackets T uh, mod, the ideal generated by the polynomial A, as an A module. Okay, on this side, um, the A module structure... Oh, sorry, I keep saying A because in my head, this is the ring A, right? I, I should have just warned you of that, but I'm trying not to do that. So as an FQ brackets T module, not A, this little guy, A, the big guy, a this ring. So as an FQ brackets T module, these are isomorphic, but here the module structure um, is given by the Carlitz module. And here the module structure is given by multiplication. Uh, sorry, on this side is given by multiplication. On this side is given by the Carlitz module. And actually, if you care about these as group schemes, you really shouldn't write this. You should write mu n because um, if in characteristic dividing n, this is not separable, and the same thing happens on this side. So um, if you had p dividing this polynomial a, or pi dividing this polynomial a, an irreducible polynomial, and you were talking about this modulo pi, whatever that will mean, then this would be also inseparable. So there's a lot 
there's a lot going on there with this analogy. Okay, and then let me tell you um, the good theorem. Maybe I'll just skip to drink on modules of rank two. There's just so much that I want to tell you. Okay, I'm going to attribute it to Hayes because he's the one that wrote it like this. So the extensions of FQ round brackets T generated by these torsion points uh, plus um, the constant field extension Okay, so here I'm talking about stuff like FQ squared, T, like that kind of stuff. So I could extend just the field of constant in my polynomial ring, and that would also be an abelian extension, so I have to count those, um, contain all abelian extensions of FQ brackets T that are not... wildly ramified at infinity. Okay, so it's, it's not quite chronic or rubber, right? They don't contain all the abelian extensions. You have to have like several lines of caveats. So you need constant field extensions also. And then all of these, these extensions that I've... Um, that I'm constructing with this Carlitz module, they're all tamely ramified at infinity. So I won't get any of the abelian extensions that are wildly ramified at infinity, but that's not that big a deal because if I want those, I can start over with a one over T instead of T. Right, so I started with everything like, you know, my, my base ring was FQ square brackets T. I could start with the polynomials in one over T and then uh, this field FQ round brackets T in one over T is isomorphic to, I mean, it's the same as FQ round brackets T. So the whole thing would go along the same, same way. I would construct, you know, a slightly different Carlos module and I would get, um, you know, different division points, and these would generate the um, extensions that I'm missing that are wildly ramified. Actually, you don't even have to pick one over T. You can pick any degree one place and still have it work. So, um, and then I just want to say, right, some of you are concerned about other function fields, right? So if you know about this theory, what I've done secretly in my heart is I started by picking the curve P1, and took its function field. And then I picked up a, a point of degree one on that curve. And my ring was all the functions regular outside of that point. And I just went from there. Say you had a different curve X that you loved. And um, this curve had a point on it, not necessarily of degree one. Then you could do everything that I've done. Uh, you could create a Carlitz module for that function field um, and, and that ring of integers and you would get extensions of that function field um, that are abelian and tamely ramified um, outside of that place. So this just does like all of the class field theory of every function field, you know, like every abelian extension, it can be gotten that way. You know, possibly by like switching places if you want like all the ramification. But okay, what I'm what what I'm trying to say is that like everything I've done was like the babyest case of like P1 as my curve and a degree one place as my place. But you, you could go you could go wild with this. Okay, so that finishes what I want to say about um, the Carlitz module. So in my last fifteen minutes, I'm going to talk about Drinfeld modules of rank two. So I'm just going to skip general um, Drinfeld modules. Hopefully that's not the ones we need to stop those reactors. But if so, we'll just be stuck. Okay, so I'm going to make my theory a little bit more um, general. 
So I'm going to like K, B, and FQ brackets T field, by which I mean there exists a map from FQ brackets T to K that's just a ring homomorphism. Okay, that's all I want. Um, you might have thought right before when this was like FQ rounds brackets T, that was just the inclusion, or when this was C infinity, that was just the inclusion. That's great. Um, but you might also want to think of quotient rings, right? You might want to think of taking your integers and modding out by, say, like a prime polynomial, um, and then that would still be a field because you're using a prime polynomial, and that would be uh, an FQ brackets T field. And that would be okay for you to do. So here what I'm setting up, right, is kind of like when you're talking about elliptic curves, you can talk about elliptic curves like over Q and over the complex numbers, but you can also talk about elliptic curves like over FP or over FQ, like a finite field with um, a finite field. So here I want to set up like any kind of field that I want to talk about. And then uh, definition, okay, um, a homomorphism homomorphism um, of FQ algebras mm -hmm. T from FQ brackets T to um, K tau, which is um, the endomorphism of FQ linear Sorry, the endomorphisms of the addi additive group but that are also FQ linear. So this is what we talked about before. So that's just a fancy way to say that. I want over K. I want over K stuff that's additive and FQ linear. We talked about that. Those are just the polynomials and tau. So you can just think polynomials and tau. Okay. Um, is a Drenfeld module over k, if and only if, uh, the first thing that I require is that phi a prime of z is equal to i of a, right? So phi sub a is like the c sub a from before, is if I take a and I map here, I get some polynomial, and I can take its derivative. I want its derivative to be i of a. So before, right, I said the linear term, when I started with t squared plus 2, the linear term was t squared plus 2. That's what I'm saying here. The linear term has to be a. Well, okay, sometimes a is not in the field k because it might be in the kernel. So I just want it to be the image of a under this map. Okay, and for some a, uh, phi of a is not a tau naught. Right, so I, I don't have just like the linear polynomials. It's a derivative from last time. Yeah, that's a polynomial, right? And I just differentiate it. I mean, I'm just saying the linear term, right? This is the same as saying that phi a of z starts out with i a z plus other stuff, because all the other stuff will disappear when I take the derivative. And I say it like this because, like, fancy people like to talk about, like, this tangent space at zero. Sorry, what did you say? What did you say? Oh, z, right, so here this is a polynomial in tau, but tau is z to the q. Uh -huh. So I have my base polynomial ring in t, and then I'm taking polynomials in those, so that's my indeterminate. The coefficient, yeah, a is an FQ brackets t, uh -huh. but um, phi of a Just is the polynomial in k in in two variables, kind of you could think, right? So if sorry, let me just write that down, right? So like, let's go back to the situation when k was this, right, then phi of a of z would be
like the coefficients of the polynomial are in the field K, but it's a polynomial in an extra indeterminate Z. Yeah, but actually I'm requiring that it's contained in the space spanned by Z, ZQ, et cetera, right? So that's why I write tau instead. Okay, and um, this Grunfeld module is of rank two if and only if the polynomial associated to T is of the form T tau naught, right? So that's forced. I have to start with T plus some number that I'll call G times tau plus delta times tau squared and delta is not zero. Okay, so compare to the Carlitz module where CT of Z was T tau naught um, plus tau, that was rank one, right? Because T was associated to a degree one polynomial in tau. So then a rank two Drenfeld module associates to T a polynomial that's degree two in tau. A rank three Dinfeld module associates to T a polynomial that's degree three in tau, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, and um, assigning T to some polynomial fully determines the whole um, map here because it's a homomorphism of FQ algebras. So it's linear in FQ and, um, and multiplicative. So we, so you can just figure out, like I did for the Carlitz module, right? If you wanted to know what phi of t squared z was, you would just do the computation like just like I did, and you would figure that out, and then, you know, et cetera. So, so usually when we talk about a Drenfeld module, we tell you only where t goes because that's enough. It pack, like the image of one right generator of this FQ algebra is enough to tell you where everything goes. So you just say that one. Okay, what do I want to tell you? Oh, I want to tell you. What's an isogeny? So Drinfeld modules of rank two behave remarkably like elliptic curves. Um, let me tell you what an isogeny is. So definition, um, an isogeny is a non-zero. I mean, okay, do you want zero to be an isogeny or not? You want it to be an endomorphism ring, so it's a ring. I don't know. It's non-zero polynomial in K tau such that, um, so sorry, an isogeny from one Drinfeld module to another Drinfeld module. So my other Drinfeld module I, I'll call psi, okay, such that, um, and I always mess up the order, but I will figure it out. Psi sub A times P is equal to P times phi of A for all A. And F Q brackets T. Okay, where here, this multiplication is composition because it's multiplication in this non-commutative ring, K curly brackets tau. Okay, and um, an isomorphism is an invertible isogeny, right?
Okay, what polynomials in here are invertible, they have to be of the form P is CZ for some Z in K. Or maybe I want to allow coefficients in K bar to get all of the isogenies. So let's figure out when two um, Drinfeld modules of rank two are isomorphic so I can end on something that I think is very nice. I, could, I can give you the moduli space of Drinfeld modules of rank two. When are phi, sorry, psi and phi isomorphic, Right? And you'll notice how much simpler it is to check this than it is to check that two elliptic curves are isomorphic. If you've ever checked that two elliptic curves were isomorphic, um, it's not something you cram in in three minutes at the end of like a, the full week of math. Right? But I can do, I can do it with Drinfeld modules. Right? Well, what I want, there should exist some number C in K bar with um, C... I always forget the composition order. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Phi T times CZ is equal to um, CZ. C, yeah, times um, Phi T. I'm just going to look at what I wrote down. There we go. Okay. So um, if... So let's, let's start with this side, what that is. So this is, you know, T, tau naught. I'm going to switch to tau notation because it helps me think of composition. Plus, you know, maybe uh, G2 tau plus delta 2 tau squared times C tau naught. And then remember, multiplication is composition. So I'm going to put... I'm, I'm going to, I, I, th I think of, of this like moving that way, like inside my polynomial. So I get T and then I apply tau naught to C tau naught, but that does nothing because that's just the identity. So that's T, C, tau naught. Okay, that's not so bad. And then I apply tau to C tau naught, right? So I get G2 C to the Q tau right? Because my C was on the right and it had to move like through the tau. So it picked up a factor, a power of Q. And then plus, right? Like this one, like I move it like kind of through my tau squared, which raises to the Q squared. So plus delta two C to the Q squared tau squared. So that's what the left hand side is. And then the right hand side, right? is C tau naught times my other Drinfeld module. Okay, but here, right, when I move stuff to the left, like tau naught does nothing. So everything will just pass through. So this is uh, TC tau naught plus um, G1 C tau plus delta one C tau squared, right? Because tau naught is just the identity. So that multiplication doesn't do anything weird. Okay. And what I want is for these things to be equal, right? Like this left-hand side and right-hand side. Okay. Well, TC is equal to TC without me doing anything, but I want um, G2 C to the Q to be equal to G1 C. And I want um, delta 2 C to the Q squared to be equal to delta 1C. And um, so if I, how do I want this? I'm going to write this as G1. It doesn't really matter, but that's C to the Q minus 1, G2. And delta 1 is C to the Q squared minus 1, delta 2. Right, that's what I need. I need both of these to be true at the same time. So if you've worked out, right, when are two short Weierstrass models for elliptic curves isomorphic, 
and you had the coefficients, you got the same kind of equation from here, right? Like um, the C4 of one equation has to be like u to the 4 times the C4 of the other equation, and the C6 of one equation has to be u to the 6 of the other equation. This is exactly the analog. These coefficients are modular forms, just like the coefficients of the Weierstrass model of a elliptic curve are uh, modular forms. And in fact, this coefficient g is an Eisenstein series, just like those c coefficients are Eisenstein series. Um, this one, delta, is a cusp form, just like our delta is a cusp form for our elliptic curves. It's a cusp form of weight q squared minus 1. This is an Eisenstein series of weight q minus 1. And then, to just finish blowing your mind, well, okay, so then looking at two, two Drinfeld modules, how can I tell they're isomorphic? I need a quantity that's invariant, right? These coefficients are not invariant. What is invariant? Well, we were very creative. We called it the J invariant. But that's the coefficient G to the cube plus one divided by delta. If you... Um, look at this ratio, right, and look back at how the G and the delta changed under isomorphism, you'll see that this is invariant under an isomorphism. So this is an isomorphism invariant of the Drinfeld module. And in fact, it completely classifies Drinfeld modules over algebraically closed fields. So over an algebraically closed field, the moduli space of Drinfeld modules of ring two is just the J line, just like it is for elliptic curves. And um, this delta is not zero. Remember at the very beginning, right, I said a Drinfeld module delta ha was not zero. And, and so the same thing, right, is like if you want to compactify it, what do you add at infinity, right? What's the like, you know, J is infinite. Well, that's when delta is zero, right? And you can see it from here. And so what's the degenerate rank two Drenfeld module? It's the Carlitz module. So for me, when I was a grad student, I read this sentence, and I think it was Katz Major. They said, oh, and then as you move towards the cusp on the moduli space of elliptic curves, the group scheme degenerates to GM. And I was just like, what the heck? What's going on? But here, you can see the Drenfeld modules of rank two degenerate to the Carlitz module. Right? It's just like, what happens? Well, delta gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's zero, and then you have a Carlitz, you have a module of rank one, which has to be the Carlitz module, which plays the role of GM in this theory. So a lot of stuff that's like kind of more opaque for elliptic curves, I think, is like very apparent for Drinfeld modules of rank two. And like I have, I got very excited last night. I have pages and pages of other analogies. Like if you know about the analytic uniformization of elliptic curves over a local field, um, you know, like over C infinity by this Q parameter, like we have that. If you know about the canonical subgroup of an elliptic curve, we have that. And they're all like a lot easier to study in this case, or like at least to define in this case. So it's an extremely productive um, line of study, like stuff you want to know about elliptic, or stuff you know about elliptic curves, you can try to prove about Drenfeld modules. That was actually my PhD thesis. It's like, take a paper about elliptic curves and like say what it says in the Drenfeld setting. So I hope that this encourages you to study both elliptic curves and Drenfeld modules because there's so much interesting stuff that you can figure out. Um, but unfortunately, I'm done, so you won't, we won't do that with me.